So continuing on from the previous video, we looked at what the final situation was. Final situation is where the door stops moving. And so the spring is compressed as it's gonna get. The door uh, stops moving. So that's how we came to the result that the kinetic energy, final kinetic energy is zero. And we're gonna be just left with spring potential energy at the final spot. So all we're left with is two terms. Initial kinetic energy gets transferred into spring potential energy. So we just use our equations for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, again, remember, is equal to one half times the mass times the velocity squared. The spring potential energy is equal to one half times the spring constant K times the displacement squared from the unstretched position. So in the problem, we're told what the stopping distance needs to be. So how much the spring can be displaced from its equilibrium position, which is 0.1 meters. Uh, we know the initial velocity, so we can just solve for the spring constant. And we find a spring constant of 10 to the six Newton meters. So that's very, very high. That's a very stiff spring. And so that matches up with what we expected at the start, where those springs aren't, aren't, very, aren't very springy, to, to put it. You know, it's very difficult to compress them, which means they have a very large spring constant. So this checks out um, and doesn't seem like it's a mistake. Moving on to the third problem. We have forces that are acting on a door and the forces are opposing each other. So we are trying to get the door from closing. So we know with doors that they rotate. You know, they have these hinges, they swing and rotate about that hinge position, which is located, I'm gonna change color, it's ro located right here. That's our pivot point. So, We know that this type of problem is going to be a torque problem and T-O-R-Q-U-E, torque problem, and specifically it's going to be a rotational equilibrium problem because we're trying to figure out the spot where or the, the force where it opposes the other force to keep the door from moving. So what are we looking for? We're looking for where the sum of the torques equals zero. So this problem deals with forces that are acting at angles. Um, and so this is a good example of where you're not gonna necessarily be given something like um, like a like a bridge problem that we did in the notes, you know something that is horizontal and we've got forces acting like this and forces acting like this, and the distances were perpendicular perpendicular to the forces. Here you have to think about what angle are you given, because remember for torque. We have to deal with an angle, and that angle, theta, is the angle between the force vector and the position vector. So if you're given an angle in a problem, you want to make sure that the angle you're given 
is the angle between the force and the position vector. Because you may be given a scenario where the angle is different from these two vectors, but you can use that angle to find the angle that's appropriate for this equation. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. May not be the angle that is given. And I'm just going to star that because uh, that's that's a really big that's a really big thing. So in this case, though, our distance vector d is along this line, and we have this force vector acting at the door. And so the angle given is the angle between those two vectors. So it is actually the angle that we're going to be using in our torque equation. So the key to, to this is you need to draw out a picture. If you have a picture and you label your angle that you're given, uh, you can't go wrong. You know, it's a lot easier to see that this position vector is, is located between the angle to the force vector. And so we can actually use that angle in our torque equation. Big thing to point out, we have labeled our coordinate system and we have labeled our rotational direction. So just keep that in mind, that's, that's definitely a big part to these. And then for the rigid free body diagram, things that I'm looking for. So I'm looking for distances that you're using. I'm looking for the forces in their correct location. And then what I did not include, which should be included, is the definition of your pivot point. So I like to put X's. Um, you can put AOR in a circle. Um, just define where your axis of rotation or your, your pivot point, wherever it's located, where are you summing your torques about? Um, make sure you label that in your diagram. And so at this point, it's, it's really just figuring out what is the sign that what is the sign of the torque that each force is causing? And then summing the torques and, and solving for the unknown force. So this is something that we've done routinely um, in, in this latest note packet. Um, so you, you should be pretty familiar with doing a problem like this. So the next problem, we've got a... Uh, We've got a block falling down an incline, and then it slides over this different surface, a rough surface. And so that rough surface is code word for friction. So rough surface equals friction. So we know that we're going to have to be dealing with um, work done by non-conservative forces automatically. So whenever you see rough surface, you should think friction. And then in terms of energy, you should be thinking work done by non-conservative forces. So this type of problem, I mean, it says it directly in the problem, use work and energy consideration. So we know we're going to have a conservation of energy problem. So again, key components to the diagram, we've got our coordinate system, we've got our initial and final 
positions labeled where we'll be choosing or defining what our energy is at those particular points. We know we're gonna have work done by non-conservative forces. So anytime work is done, need to include a work diagram. And then just to keep track of forces and to be able to draw our work diagram, I included a free body diagram of a block. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be looking for that. I'm not going, I wouldn't take off points if that's not included. I would take off points for a work diagram. And honestly, I should have put that up at the top for things that I would be looking at. I'll include that um, list of things that I'll take off points for um, in the in this practice page and on the exam page. So at this point, it's it's using our conservation of of energy equation that we've had a lot of practice with. So again, once you choose your initial and final spots, then it, it really is just identifying what's going on. So for the initial, it's starting from rest. So we know the kinetic energy is zero. We have no springs in this problem. So all the spring potential energy is zero. So we're just starting off with gravitational potential energy since it's above the certain height. So since we have gravitational potential energy, you must have the zero point defined in your diagram. And so that's located right here. So the next thing, can we get rid of work done by non-conservative forces? So the answer should be a, a really big no, because we talked about it, a rough surface, we have friction acting, so we need to keep the work done by non-conservative forces because we're going to have work done. At the end, the energy that's lost to friction is going to get accounted for, it on, accounted for on that left side. We're not told anything about whether it stops. All we're told is that it slows down. So we're going to have kinetic energy at the end. And so how do we know that? Well, we're told that it's traveling at 0.3 meters per second um, after a certain distance that it hits at the rough spot. So we know we're going to have kinetic energy still at the final. So we've got everything worked out. Uh, we've identified all of our energy sources um, and the different spots, the initial and the final spots. So now it's just carrying out what we know how to do. And so starting off, you just start off with your energy equation. You have to do a little work first with the figuring out how much work done work is done by non-conservative forces. So you need to start with the work equation, force times distance times the cosine of the angle between them. That's where this work diagram comes into play. That helps you identify what the angle is. So the displacement is opposite the direction of the force. So we have cosine of 180. So we have negative work done by friction, which makes sense. So now that we've identified the work done by friction, which is the work done by non-conservative forces, we can substitute that into our energy equation. And we can come down and we can solve for the frictional force that's acting. Once we find the frictional force, then we can determine what the coefficient of friction is on that surface. 